Ladies and gentlemen, it's really fantastic to welcome parents from both the girls and the boys school this evening to what promises to be a really valuable and thought provoking talk. Uh, we'd be very grateful if you would please ensure that you're muted throughout the talks. I'm going to start recording now and it really is a very great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker this morning, uh, this evening rather. Dr. Faith Orchard is a highly acclaimed chartered psychologist conducting research examining the development, maintenance and treatment of child and adolescent anxiety and depression based at the University of Sussex. Faith's work is currently focused on the role of sleep in adolescent mental health and she's developed the Sleeping Better programme which is being piloted in, in child and adolescent mental health services as well as in schools. She's really passionate about improving the lives of young people and their families and will be talking to us this evening about young people and sleep. The talk will last for around an hour, after which time there will be the opportunity to ask questions. If you do have a question, ladies and gentlemen, do feel free to put it in the chat and then Faith will hopefully be able to answer it at the end or at an appropriate time. Uh, Faith, we welcome you very warmly. Many thanks for joining us. And without further ado, I will hand over to you. Thanks, Richard, and thank you for the lovely um, introduction. Hi everyone, um, it's a pleasure to be here with you this evening, kind of in your homes I suppose. Um, but yeah, really nice to be talking to you and, and like Richard said, I'm, I'm hoping we can have quite an um, interactive session. So, you know, please do post comments and thoughts in the chat and we'll have a few um, activities where you can tell us what you think in the chat as well. So as Richard uh, explained, my background is in child and adolescent mental health. But over the past um, five or so years, I've been doing work specifically looking at sleep um, and the role that sleep plays in young people's well-being. Um, and that's what we're going to be focusing on today. So just to give a bit of an overview as to sort of uh, the structure for the talk, I suppose. Um, so I'm going to start with talking about a bit of the background as to how we sleep and why we sleep. Um, and in particular, what happens for teenagers. So there are some quite significant changes to sleep in teenage years that we'll um, talk about. And we're going to think a little bit about how sleep relates to some common mental health difficulties. Then for the second half of the, the talk, we'll move on to thinking a bit more about how we can support young people with their sleep better. And I'm hoping here that I can tell you a little bit about the evidence, but also give you some ideas for things that you might like to try yourselves at home or, or you might want to try out with your with your children. So that's the plan. OK, so I'd like to start by getting you all to dig out the chat button if you can in your Zoom um, and tell me what, why you think sleep is important. So what are the impacts of having a good night's sleep or what are the impacts of having a bad night's sleep? How do we feel the next day? So I can see the chat on my other screen. So if I turn my head, apologies, if it looks a bit um, odd, but I'm gonna try and read some of your ideas. Some really great ideas coming in, keep them coming. Okay, so I'm gonna start flicking through some of your suggestions. So we've got um, regeneration and growth, uh, overall health, energy, recovering, uh, concentration coming up a few times, um, feeling energized, being able to focus and think properly, uh, healing and recuperation, yeah, um, being more energetic the next day, our mood, these are brilliant. Uh, some nice ones around memory and learning, really good there. Um, uh, yeah, health, mental health processing eating better that's a really interesting one that actually this links to other parts of our well-being and not just our our sleep uh yeah de uh, decompressing from stress 
brilliant some absolutely fantastic suggestions i think um you've covered most of the ones i had let me see what i put on my slide um so yeah so we've spoken about energy and concentration um i've got on there about actually risks and accidents if we're if we're too tired and we haven't slept um we can quite easily make mistakes uh, we had mood and energy concentration memory and health so i think you've covered all of them um so brilliant job there in the chat and, and really nice to kind of hear your thoughts coming in so yeah so we know you know and for many of you that might just be personal experience of knowing what happens you know depending on how good our sleep is or is not um so i think you know the nice thing about talking through sleep with people is that most people understand why it's important you know most of us have lived it and know how we feel the next day when it's been a really bad night's sleep so it makes it a really easy accessible thing for us all to talk about and understand so i want to just talk um, i'm not going to spend too long on this but just talk a little bit about how we sleep um, and this is quite important when we come on to later um, thinking about the techniques for improving sleep. So there's two processes involved in sleep and waking. One is called the sleep homeostasis. And this is essentially the pressure that builds up to help us fall asleep. So throughout the day, the longer we're awake, the more tired we will feel in the evening. So it is just as simple as that. It's the drive for sleeping. The second process is then more about our body clock. So every cell in our body works on approximately a 24 hour clock. And it means that we know when certain things are going to happen. We know when to expect our breakfast, when to expect our dinner um, and when we should be falling asleep and getting up. So our body releases the right hormones at the right time so that we can fall asleep. And these two processes work really closely together. So I've just put a little figure there on the um, slide. Hopefully you can sort of see this, but um, so you've got the two lines there. You've got the sleep pressure, which is the blue line, which as you can see builds up throughout the day. And then the red line, which is the wiggly one, which kind of interleaves throughout the day and the night. And what you want is when you're coming up to bedtime, you want the blue line and the red line to be far, far apart. So you want the pressure to be really high and you want the hormones to be kicking in for sleep. And this is melatonin is the key hormone here. Um, and then what happens throughout the night is our sleep pressure um, kind of gradually tails off because we don't need the sleep anymore. And then the hormones are released in the morning to help us wake up. So we then wake up when the lines are close together. So that's the kind of the, the, the basics of how we actually go about sleeping. Um, just a, a, a little bit more detail about the kind of the biology. Um, so you've probably heard a little bit about sleep stages. So we have what's known as rapid eye movement sleep or REM sleep, which you've probably heard of. Now, this is the stage of sleep where our brain activity is really rapid and we normally dream during REM sleep. Um, and actually, when we look at this on a, um, an EEG recording, the REM sleep looks quite similar to awake. So our brain really is, is really kind of busy during REM. The reason it's called this is that often if someone's in REM sleep, you'll see that their eyes are moving, they're darting. So the eyelids will be moving quite rapidly during REM sleep. Then all the other stages are then the non-REM and they're split up depending on how deep or light the sleep is. So the first stage is really light down to the third stage, which is the deepest stage of sleep. Um, these are a little bit harder to differentiate um, and these normally need to be identified using um, laboratory sleep um, equipment, but you can normally tell them apart by a range of things like brain activity, heart rate, um, how fast you're breathing. Um, so it's the combination of these things that can tell us which stage we're in. And also what happens is during the night, we spend a different amount of time in each stage of sleep. So this is where the kind of the it's quite interesting thinking about those ideas you had about why we sleep, because the different stages serve different purposes. So the, the deeper stages of sleep are really important for the kind of the biological repair, um, rest, regrowth, hormones, all the kind of the, the recovery that needs to occur will happen in the deeper stages of sleep. And we have most of those, as you'll see from the graph at the earlier part of the night. So we spend more time in deep sleep um, in the early part of the night. And then as, 
as we gradually go towards the morning, we spend more time then in the lighter stages of sleep. This is what we call a hypnogram, which is the kind of the graph of what stage you would expect an average adult to, um, to be in over the night. And what you'll see is that throughout the night, there are also brief awakenings and that's completely normal. So for some people, they might know they've woken up really briefly. And for some people, they'll have no idea and it will have just happened um, kind of without them consciously being aware that it's happened. But that's completely normal. Um, and the reason it happens is that when we're in REM sleep, we're in such a light stage of sleep that it's really easy for us to kind of float in between um, being in REM and being awake. And then obviously, as we kind of transition, we spend more time in REM, REM sleep and then we're ready to wake up and we've kind of spent enough time in all the right stages for our brain and our body to do all the things that need to occur. So we know quite a lot about how we sleep, but the why of sleeping is a little bit more complicated. Um, and I really love this quote back from the 70s. Um, this is from a, a professor in America who said, if sleep doesn't serve some vital function, it's the biggest mistake evolution has ever made. And the reason behind this quote was that there was all this evidence growing back in the, the 70s around how not sleeping actually was really, really dangerous. And there was animal studies where animals would die if they weren't given you know, opportunities to sleep. And so there was this kind of growing recognition that this is absolutely crucial. Um, but it was really hard to understand why it was so crucial. Why was it making animals and humans so poorly if we deprived them of sleep? So various theories were kind of gradually proposed over time and they started off being very evolutionary that we needed to rest and conserve energy. But there's various examples of animals that don't need to rest or conserve energy. Um, and they were kind of arguments against that theory. So then these slightly more complex theories started to emerge. And this is where, again, we see that mirroring with your suggestions in the chat. So we know that we have various things happening that are very much about um, recovery and restoration. We also know that there's some more cognitive things going on as well. So within the brain, we are doing things like learning, processing memories, but also forgetting. So our brain can get rid of the stuff that it doesn't need. So there's also lots of other stuff going on as well. Um, interestingly, kind of thinking about the topic today, there's also some evidence that there's a bit of emotional recalibration. So during the night, as part of that kind of learning and forgetting, we're also dealing with emotional memories and events as well. So we still don't really know why um, it's kind of life critical that we sleep, but we do know that it serves some significantly important um, functions. So um, I'm just going to move on to talking a little bit about how sleep changes over the course of childhood. I'm not going to spend too much on the younger years, but I just want to outline some key details for you. Um, so I would imagine most or many of you will be quite familiar with this um, infant sleep and then childhood sleep and the challenges perhaps that it might bring. Um, but there's some really interesting things going on with the those things that cause sleep that I mentioned earlier, so the body clock. So in the first few months of life, the body clock is still developing and it's not quite developed yet. And actually, interestingly, very early in life, um, infants don't create their own melatonin in the sleep hormone. It's generated through breast milk. Um, but over the kind of the first six months, these things become quite well established. Um, so we have this development of the body clock um, and we have the hormones that can help us fall asleep. We obviously also start with infants needing a lot of sleep. So um, we might be seeing infants getting around 12 to 16 hours at the first kind of um, at the six month time point. And then that's reducing over the first couple of years. As um, you know, kind of clinicians and experts working in sleep, often the, the problems that we try and work with in these early ages are more around safety and routine. So making sure infants are safe whilst they're asleep and helping families to get some routine into place so that they're not really sleep deprived. As we get into childhood, the types of problems that we might be working with um, are a bit different. So again, we kind of continue to see a reduction in sleep, um, getting down from um, 10 to 13 hours for preschool age into about nine to 12 hours for, for school age children. Again, kind of 
declining over those years. And during these childhood years is when we start seeing, I guess, more clinical sleep problems that can emerge. And some of them can be quite common. So insomnia, night terrors, um, restless egg syndrome. Some of these things are actually not that uncommon in children um, and would be problems that we would be trying to, to work with. Now, adolescence is a really fascinating period of development for lots of reasons. And I wanted to share this um, graph, which I talk about a lot in, um, in my lectures at, you know, at the university, but also in, in public talks. Um, and I think you know, the, the nice thing about this graph is that it recognizes that adolescents are really quite vulnerable to lots of difficulties. Um, and in particular, this data is taken from uh, mental health difficulties. So this, um, these blocks, these shapes represent when different difficulties emerge. And you'll see that they kind of cluster around adolescents. So adolescents are really vulnerable to quite a wide range of different difficulties when we think about mental health. But they're also really vulnerable to sleep problems. Um, and I'm going to talk you through why that's the case then. Why is it that teenagers are particularly vulnerable? So I think the first thing to say, or to be aware of, is that all of us, not just teenagers, have very different sleep needs. So some people will need more sleep, some people will need less sleep. Some people are the owls who go to bed late and wake up or prefer to have a lion in the morning. Um, and some people are the larks who need to get an early night and they're up bright and early um, first thing. And some people will fall somewhere in between. There's not any reason that any of these things are problematic. They're just completely normal individual differences that occur for all of us. In terms of the kind of the recommended amount of sleep, teenagers are, um, I don't want to say advice, I guess we're not telling them how many, how many hours sleep to get, but the guidance suggests that about eight to 10 hours sleep is right for teenagers. And that number is based on the evidence around how much sleep we need to be doing all those really important functions. So being able to learn, being able to remember, being able to feel okay the next day. So it's about how much sleep is needed to, to function well. But the evidence seems to suggest that worldwide, and this is not just Western countries or the UK, that only about a third of teenagers get the right amount of sleep that is recommended for their functioning. And there's a lot, there's a lot of kind of interacting factors that make that the case that I'm going to talk you through. So um, adolescent sleep has been really nicely described the perfect storm. Um, this was done by Mary Cascadden, who is a, an American um, sleep uh, academic. Um, and she really nicely talks about these interacting factors that kind of collide and, and cause real difficulties for teenagers. And some of which are things that they have very little control over. So I'm going to talk about the range of factors that do influence teenage sleep um, and I've broken them down into three categories so the biological factors the psychological factors and then the more society driven influences so if you remember at the start of the talk I talked about how we have this circadian clock this rhythm that tells our body what time we should go to bed now in teenage years what happens is that that circadian rhythm is delayed so it pushes backwards so we're not ready for sleep at the same time as we were when we were children or actually when we move into adulthood so this is a purely adolescent delay that occurs um, and again it, there'll be individual differences but it might be that rather than falling asleep at nine o'clock we're now falling asleep at 11 30 um, and then when we move back to um, adults it might go back a bit a little bit earlier again so it really is very unique. And what's quite interesting is that we also see this in other animals. So it's not a human thing. It purely is a very kind of environment, uh, sorry, evolutionary biological thing that happens across the animal kingdom. Um, but teenagers have no control over it. It does just happen to them. We then have the more psychological factors and, and for teenagers here, we're normally talking about things like independence. So um, having a bit more choice over their bedtimes, having a bit more choice about uh, how they spend their evenings, who they talk to. Um, in the kind of non lockdown days, we might be talking about socializing out. So, you know, going out to friends houses in the evening, um, spending time outdoors. At the moment, it's probably more likely to look like online socializing. 
Um, so often teenagers will be interacting, actually even not in lockdown times, often quite late into the evening on uh, mobile devices or, or computers. Then the final factor, which is about society, here we see some quite interesting influences. So we know that teenagers start drinking kind of more caffeine um, and more sugar, um, again, possibly driven by a little bit of that independence um, that they start to uh, you know, experience when they're teenagers. But there's also quite an interesting factor that happens here with schools. So if you think about that um, biological clock that I said that changes, that would probably be OK if teenagers could go to bed at midnight and wake up at nine. Um, they would function OK if they could do that. But um, across you know, the UK and across many other countries, in fact, most countries, what happens is that secondary school continues on at the same start time as primary school. Um, and this is something that we have very little control over. But it means that in the school week, the window for sleep is restricted. So teenagers have no control over when they fall asleep because their clock's been pushed back later. But they also have no control over getting up for school. So they end up with a shortened window where they actually get sleep deprived during the week. Um, and so naturally, you know, they are struggling to function that, you know, they have to try and concentrate, but their bodies are not as ready for concentrating or learning um, as they would be if they'd got um, more sleep the night before. So we have this colliding um, influence of these all these different factors going on that make adolescents quite vulnerable. There's also what we call in um, the sleep research a phenomenon known as social jet lag. So again, if think about what I've just said. So we know that during the week, teenagers are sleep deprived. And at the weekend, they probably want to catch up on their sleep. Also, what happens at the weekend is they're probably doing more socialising. So the influence of this sleep loss and the social pressures mean they probably have a later night on a Friday and a Saturday and a longer lie-in on a Saturday and a Sunday. But what then happens is then Monday morning, they're chucked back um, and they need to get up early again. And what is effectively happening to their bodies is what we experience when we travel and we get jet lag. Remember that traveling thing that we used to be able to do. Um, so they get this, this feeling of jet lag and not only that, but it's the bad kind of jet lag where you're going um, eastwards. So, you know, New York, New York to London, um, because what's happening is the teenagers need to wake up earlier than their bodies want them to wake up on a Monday morning. And it makes the, the kind of the brain and the body very muddled and very confused. And this happens every week. Um, so every every Friday night, every Monday morning, there are these shifts in, in sleep patterns going on. So I've spoken about, I guess, the normal teenage sleep difficulties, what we would expect the majority of teenagers to be experiencing. But there are, of course, also more clinical sleep problems that can occur. Um, and some of these are quite common in teenagers. So in particular, we might see things like insomnia, where we're not getting um, enough sleep or we're getting much less sleep. And this is normally through problems, falling asleep, um, staying asleep during the night and then waking up much too early in the morning. Uh, we also can sometimes see problems with hypersomnia, which is the opposite difficulty where we have where we get too much sleep. Um, this isn't as common in teenagers um, whilst they're at school because they don't have much choice if they're getting up. But we often see this if teenagers are not at school, they might then slip into cycles where they're sleeping way more than the recommended amount. Um, we also quite commonly in teenagers see what's called delayed sleep phase disorder or um, DSPD and this is where that circadian shift is even more extreme so it's not just shifting back to 11 or 12 this might be shifting to 2 3 a.m in the morning um, and again as you can imagine that can cause lots of knock-on effects um, where we're really struggling to function there's lots of other recognized sleep difficulties as well, um, particularly things like parasomnias. So this is your kind of um, night terrors, nightmares, sleepwalking. I'm not going to talk so much about those today. I'm going to focus much more on the um, insomnia type problems and how we can work with those difficulties with getting to sleep. 
So before we kind of move on to thinking about how we work with sleep problems, I just want to spend a couple of slides talking about the relationship between sleep and mental health. So we know that sleep problems are really common amongst many emotional and behavioral difficulties. So for example, sleep is a recognized symptom of anxiety and depression. It's also recognized difficulty in, in problems like ADHD. Um, we see it in a whole host of, of different um, problems that can occur in children and in adults. It's not, not unique to children. Um, and just, I think one example of how kind of um, common these problems are, there was a study done a few years back where they found that amongst teenagers who were experiencing depression sleep problems were more common than low mood um, so the kind of the obvious symptom that we assume is going to be um, associated with depression was not as common and having problems as having problems sleeping so sleep really is a, a huge component of lots of other problems as well um, I also just wanted to show you some data that we published last year, which I think, again, highlights why we might be um, aware um, and um, kind of protective over making sure that we get good sleep when we're teenagers. So some of you might be familiar um, with a piece of research that was known as the children of the 90s. So this was um, done in Bristol, and this is, as the name suggests, back in the early 90s. So. Um, I think about 14,000 mothers, pregnant women, were recruited into the study, and the purpose was to examine child development over the following years. Um, a really brilliant piece of research that is now still ongoing. So the children are now um, hitting their 30s, um, and they're still collecting data on the families. So it's a really quite incredible uh, piece of research and it's really nice because what they've also done is made it quite accessible to other academics so you can apply to look at this data and answer questions that you're interested in so we applied to look at sleep and mental health and what we did was um, there was a, a when the children were 15 years um, they took part in a kind of a subset of the study um, so a, a handful not all of the, the young people took part but a a handful of them, although 5,000, so not quite a handful, um, but 5,000 young people took part in this sort of sleep specific study where they filled in measures of their sleep patterns and how good their sleep was, but also they completed measures about their mental health. Um, and then what was really nice for us was that they then had throughout later years, so later into adolescence and into early adulthood, they had more measures collected on mental health, so on anxiety and depression. And what this meant was that we could look at sleep problems in teenagers and whether or not that was predictive of future mental health problems. So just a kind of a, a quick summary of the results. So we found that those the school night sleep, so where I talked about sleep being particularly vulnerable, was a significant predictor of anxiety and depression at all of the time points that we measured. So the teenagers that were getting the, the least amount of sleep on those school nights were much more vulnerable to future mental health problems. Um, and we saw a similar pattern for some aspects of sleep quality. Um, so in particular, problems with being very tired in the day, um, waking up in the night, and having this perception of not getting enough sleep, again, were all predictors of, of future mental health. Uh, like I said, it's the same with the total sleep time. What we saw here was that the teenagers with the kind of the worst problems in these areas were the ones that were more vulnerable. Um, so I don't want you all to be now very worried about your um, your young people, because like, what's important to say is that with um, any study like this, you know, you would always expect your um, what we call the effect sizes to be quite small. So, you know, not every young person with a sleep problem at this age would go on to experience mental health problems. That's not the case at all. Um, really, what we were trying to highlight was that this will play a role for some young people who might also be vulnerable in other ways. So there's likely to be lots of factors that um, are relevant to both sleep and mental health that might be um, underpinning these relationships. But for us, it was more about really bringing to attention um, how important sleep is. And it was a really nice piece of work that got picked up quite well in the media. So, you know, we really kind of we've really noticed the impact of people starting to listen a bit more about why we should really be supporting teenagers as best we can, um, which has been a really nice positive outcome of the work. 
Okay, um, I feel like I've spoken quite a lot. Um, so I'm going to just introduce this next section and I'm going to hand over to you guys in a, in a minute as well for some um, of your ideas in the chat. So for the second half of the talk, I'm going to move on to thinking a little bit more about how we can work with sleep problems. And I'm very much going to be focused on the psychological techniques um, because that's my area of expertise. Um, so first of all, and um, I did see a, a question coming up on the chat actually that might link to sleep measurements, although I haven't had the chance to read it properly yet. But before we get into thinking about techniques, I wanted to just touch on monitoring sleep um, because for some people this might be useful, but it also is an important part whenever we do any sleep interventions, we really need to find out what's going on. And there's lots of ways that we can do this. Um, so can we, we can use some very simple self-report questionnaires um, that have been you know, evidence to give us good information about sleep. We could do diagnostic interviews if we were looking for things like insomnia. But I guess the measure we use the most are sleep diaries. Um, so these are really simple little you know, self-report tools where we get young people to tell us um, information about their sleep over the course of a week or, or two weeks or, or however long we're working with them for. Um, and I don't know if you can see it on the slide, but there's an example on there. I'm, I'm going to show you this um, a bit later again, actually, so you will see it um, a bit bigger. But we ask questions like, what time did you get into bed? What time did you put the lights out and try to sleep? How long did it take you to fall asleep? Et cetera, et cetera. And this gives us really useful information about total sleep time, but also awake time. So how much of the night was, was the young person awake? There are also then your more biological measures of sleep. So if you were doing sleep in the laboratory, you would be talking about polysomnography or PSG, which includes lots of different measurements um, of things like EEG, heart rate, um, et cetera, et cetera. That gives us the most comprehensive um, measure of sleep. We also might use Acti watches, which are essentially movement devices that are worn on the watch and they give you an indication of, of sleep um, quantity and quality as well. Now, um, nicely in the chat, someone's touched on Fitbit um, and I'm going to talk about Fitbits um, now. So absolutely right, Fitbits can measure sleep, um, but I'm going to chuck in a caveat. So the reliability of the Fitbits um, in terms of the research evidence at the moment suggests that they're not as reliable as we would want um, if we were to be doing um, treatment or research on sleep problems. So I've just given you a couple of um, studies. Now these, considering how quickly Fitbit um, and, and Apple and various other models, um, how quickly they release uh, new versions, these studies are actually a little bit old now. Um, but various different devices have been um, examined and what seems to be the case and if anyone has got a fitbit um, what you might know is that some of them have what they call normal settings and sensitive settings so the normal settings seem to overestimate sleep so they think that you get more sleep than you actually do and the sensitive settings tend to underestimate and think that you don't get as much sleep as you do um, so, I mean, like I said, these studies are a bit old and we do need kind of the research to keep up with the pace of the devices, which is always very tricky because research can take a long time. Um, but based on the evidence that we have at the moment, as I've said, as part of research or treatment, we wouldn't be in a position to be using these kind of more accessible devices. But they are absolutely fine for general monitoring. Um, I'm not in any way suggesting that we shouldn't use them. I think it's fine to use them. But if we are working with people who have quite severe sleep problems, then we wouldn't want to depend on the Fitbit to give us a reliable um, kind of measurement of sleep. So just a kind of just to chuck that in, just to be cautious if we are um, uh, using any of these tools, um, just to be mindful what they how reliable they, they may or may not be. OK, so. Um, I'm going to then focus mostly for the rest of the talk on the techniques involved in treating sleep problems. Um, and I'm going to draw from a psychological approach called cognitive, beha beha cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia. Sorry, the evening is obviously starting to kick into my speech. Um, so CBTI is, is what the program is known as. Um, and this is a really nice evidence-based program that improves insomnia in both adults and adolescents. 
And there's lots of different aspects to CBTI and I've outlined them here on the slide and I'm going to briefly talk over them. But what I'm going to do is go through these in a bit more detail for the remainder of the talk. Um, so a program of CBT would include lots of different components. We would do a bit of sleep and psychoeducation, exactly like we've done today. So how do we sleep? Why do we sleep? What's going on in the body? And we'd start with that sleep monitoring. So getting people to fill in sleep diaries so that we really have a sense of what their sleep looks like. Um, some programs will also include what we would call thought challenging. So often when we experience problems with insomnia, we might find that we start worrying a lot about our sleep. So we're lying in bed at night thinking it's going to be awful. I can't sleep tomorrow. I'm not going to be able to focus. And the more that we worry, the more that we can't sleep. But then also the next day, we might already be worrying about the night ahead and what's going to happen. So we need to start breaking some of those patterns of worrying. We then have the more behavioral aspects of um, CBTI. So we have what we call sleep hygiene, which is where we create good routines that help us to fall asleep. Um, we also have something called stimulus control, which is quite similar, and I will distinguish them when we come to talk about them in more detail. But stimulus control essentially refers to making the bedroom environment as kind of sleep friendly as possible. It's about creating a good relationship between the bedroom and sleeping. And then the final aspect, which um, we use in some treatments, not in all treatments, um, is where we actually restructure the sleep. So we would move the sleep window around so that it ends up in the perfect place to get the best sleep quality possible. So like I said, I'm going to talk through some of these in a bit more detail um, and hopefully uh, this will be useful and, and you know, we can pick up some of your ideas as well. Just to say, um, before we do that quickly, I'm not going to spend long on this, but just to highlight that we've also got really good evidence that these sleep interventions improve mental health as well. So we did um, what we call a, a meta-analysis where you look at all the research that's been done in the area and kind of examine the results together. And we found that where uh, researchers had delivered sleep interventions, um, we saw big improvements for depression as well. So just to note that these things seem to be really good for a range of aspects of well-being and not just sleep, probably like we've talked about because of how interlinked these difficulties are. Oh, so I was going to talk about the techniques. Sorry, I've just got a couple of slides first just to outline our intervention. So um, Richard actually mentioned this in the introduction at the start. So we've developed an adolescent um, sleeping program, which draws on the principles of CBTI. Um, it was based on a model developed by Jason Ellis, um, who is a health psychologist in Northumbria, um, and he works in insomnia. Um, and he uses quite a brief program. And for us, this is quite important. We didn't want anything too cumbersome for teenagers. Um, so we've been doing this We've been developing this program, um, which is four weeks long. It's targeted for young people who have problems getting to sleep. And because I work um, or I come from a mental health background, we also developed it to be suitable for young people who are experiencing mental health problems as well. Um, we had to adapt it slightly to accommodate young people. And the main things here really were including parents. Um, so making sure the parents understood what we were doing with the young people um, and thinking about things like that circadian rhythm and, and other things that are going to be influencing sleep. And the programme really draws on these components that I mentioned just now, very much the behavioural components. So the sleep hygiene, the stimulus control and the sleep rescheduling that I mentioned just now. This is just so you can see it. Um, I don't know if you can still see this. In fact, actually what I can do, um, uh, Richard, Abby and Trina, um, who, if you're listening in the background, I could send you a sleep diary if it's useful and, and you could disseminate that to um, families if they would find it helpful. Um, but this is the sleep diary that we use. Um, so again, as I've outlined, there's a number of questions and this tells us some really key things about total sleep time and what we call time in bed. So how long you're in bed in total, even if you're awake. And we use these as part of the intervention. OK, that is what I was trying to get to so that I could have a breather and you could talk for a minute. So um, I'd like in the chat for you to suggest what you might think some good sleep hygiene practices might be. 
Um, so this might be from your own experience or from things that you've heard, um, any ideas that you might have, and I will um, kind of follow them through and, and then talk about other suggestions that we might have as well. And have a drink of water whilst I take a breather. Also, just to say, I've spotted that a couple of questions have been coming into the chat. Please do um, post any questions you've got in the chat, and at the end, we will we'll try and work through them um, and answer as many as we can. So, some really great ideas coming in. Keep them coming. Okay, so keep um, posting any ideas you've got, and I'm going to start kind of working through them. Um, so uh, we've got reading before bed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, having regular eating times, that's a really good one. So we, again, it's all about the routine. We want our body to know what our routine is. Screen time is a really big one. I've seen lots of comments on this. So lots of people suggesting that no screen use for 30 minutes or an hour before bed. Um, again, reading, meditation, yeah, absolutely, and winding, having a dark, cool room, yeah, great. Um, that would probably be part of our, well, I suppose it could be sleep hygiene as well as use control, actually, be a little bit of both. Journaling is another really nice one. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but this is a really nice technique, particularly if we are having worries at night, it can help us just get everything out. Going to bed at the same time, absolutely, that's a brilliant one. I'm going to talk about that quite a lot. Um, yep, screens, cool room, reading in bed, meditating, yep, loose coat clothing, that's quite a nice one, so making sure we're nice and comfy when we're in bed, tea or coffee, yeah, absolutely, we don't want to be having um, caffeine, normally uh, you'll see my um, recommendations in a minute, but um, normally we suggest trying to avoid this definitely in the evening, ideally in the afternoon, if we are, you know, really struggling to get to sleep. Audiobooks is a great one. Um, particularly because it means we don't have to look at any devices so we don't have any issues with um kind of that kind of stimulation um no clutter really nice yeah phone downstairs great one um if you can get your teenagers to agree um you're definitely on to a winner or just having the bed, uh, phone in a different room um bubble bath yep yeah, I really like the idea about friends not sending messages. That's fantastic. Really nice to get um, friends on board. I think that's such a difficult one for teenagers if everyone else is engaging as well. Um, not drinking too much liquid. These are fantastic. Really, really good. Uh, yeah, having a shower. Um, we always get quite mixed responses to showers. Some people find them quite stimulating. Other people find them quite relaxing. I think it comes down to personal preference. Uh, exercising early in the day is a brilliant one. Yep. So we don't want to be creating lots of kind of energy. This can sometimes be tricky because lots of young people engage in um, hobbies in the evening. So sometimes you can't help it, but they will have sports at night. Oh, there's loads still coming. Um, what else have we got? Um, fresh bedding. Yeah. Gratitude's a really nice one. Again, that's a bit like the journaling effect. Not working in the evening. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Really, really great suggestions. All um, absolutely in line with what I would be saying. Um, these are the ones that um, I would suggest. Um, and I think they tie in quite closely with a lot of yours. Um, so... Yeah, so we've got things about caffeine. Um, so actually one thing that didn't come up is that it's, it's really good to get exercise in the day, but not ideally in the evening. Um, so getting exercise in the day will help us to um, make sure that we've kind of, you know, we've been outdoors, we've kind of tired ourselves out, our body's tired and ready for sleep in the evening. Um, we also didn't speak much about light. So we want to be dark at night, but actually 
what we haven't really talked so much about is getting up in the morning um, and particularly because of those problems with the circadian rhythm we want natural light so we very much want to you know check open our curtains first thing and get that natural light in to help us wake up and, and stimulate us um, so yeah we had the ones about the bedroom um, electronics absolutely we want to be trying to get off the electronics um ideally um kind of at least 30 minutes if not longer before bed and um, a few of you suggesting the um detaching from the day which is really nice and lots of suggestions for relaxing now what i want to i guess chuck in here is to say that these are just suggestions they don't work for everybody so some people will find that some things work really well other people will find that some things don't work really well and some things are just not that easy to do um, particularly for teenagers we often have a lot of negotiation around electronic devices um, and i think particularly when we're working with young people although it also happens if we do work with adults as well um, you need to find what is feasible there's no point suggesting things that are just not going to be done because then it's unhelpful we've got to find things that are are feasible and this will tie into the next section as well on um, stimulus control um, so just before we move on um, another aspect of sleep hygiene that's really important that i don't think did come up actually in the chat is napping um, now napping is quite problematic if you're dealing with insomnia um, i guess that's also another thing to say i am here talking about insomnia so it's okay to have bad habits as long as your sleep is fine and you function okay um, but when sleep is not fine that's when we want to try and find techniques that help um, so we use this idea of the pizza dough when we work with young people, which is the idea that if you keep the pizza dough squeezed together all in one kind of tight ball, you don't get any holes, it's nice and contained. But if you stretch it, imagine it's like sleep, if you stretch it out over the course of the day, you start getting holes in it and it becomes broken. And it means that then at night it's going to be quite um, kind of well, broken, I guess. So, you know, you're, you're going to find that you're waking up. Um, you're not going to necessarily sleep all the way through really well. So we want to build up this sleep pressure. Um, and this comes back to the, what I was talking about right at the start about our sleep homeostasis, where we build up this drive. If we nap, we break the build up of the sleep drive. Um, and if we remember back to our graph, you can see here, um, if you imagine our blue line is the sleep homeostasis and we get rid of our sleep pressure, we're then not going to have that nice gap between the blue line and the red line when we come to um, bed, when we come to get into bed. So again, it's okay to nap if your sleep's not a problem, but if your sleep is a problem, napping is a good thing to um, cut out of the equation. So stimulus control is the other aspect, and, it, and it's not overly dissimilar from sleep hygiene, um, but this is more about the um, physiology, I guess, the, the associations that our brain makes with our bedroom. So if sleep hygiene is about getting our kind of bodies ready for bed, this is about when we get into bed, our brain going, yep, now it's bedtime, I know where we are, this is what we do, we go to sleep. Um, now this is where it gets particularly tricky for teenagers especially at the moment and you know covid has really thrown up a lot of complications for us with um, teenage sleep now the reason it's a problem is that what we would ideally want is the bedroom to be a kind of a unique environment where the only thing we really do in there is we rest and we sleep and um you know it's quite calm and relaxing so normally we would be saying you know try and avoid watching tv in bed um ideally do homework at a desk or in a separate room um, and only sleep in bed so don't sleep anywhere else in the house make sure that you create this really strong relationship between sleep and bed but this is obviously normally quite tricky for teenagers who have got homework um, and even trickier now that we're doing schoolwork at home um, so this really has been quite difficult and it's also not always the case that young people have got other places to do their work they might be um, uh, you know they might be quite confined to having to do it in the bedroom so this is again is a tricky one and it comes back to that negotiation about what's feasible but where possible we want to create that nice strong association Um, so 
if we are struggling to fall asleep, so if we're doing all the right stuff and we're still having this difficulty falling asleep, um, we often get into this cycle where we feel quite restless, we can't get to sleep, and then we're frustrated. And the more frustrated we get, um, but the more awake we are and the more restless we become. So there are a couple of techniques here that we can think about. Um, one is distraction. So you've all heard of counting sheep. Um, and whilst it might seem a bit of a, an old wives tale, it's actually based in um, a bit of science. So whilst we're lying in bed worrying about not being able to sleep, um, as I said, we, we make ourselves more awake. So we want to try and distract ourselves from the worrying. So one thing we sometimes suggest um, is anything that we can do that is a bit boring and a bit distracting, that's a kind of a mind game. And again, a bit of personal preference here. Some people would not want to do these things, but it might be um, some kind of counting. It might be some kind of word game. Um, what we want to do is just something that takes us away from those thoughts that are making us feel stressed. So we can try a bit of distraction. We can also um, enforce what we call the 20 minute rule. So the longer we lie in bed worrying about sleep, the harder it is to fall asleep. And the longer this goes on, the bigger the problem becomes. So what in our kind of treatment program, what we do is that we recommend that if you've been in bed for 15 to 20 minutes and you still can't sleep and you're trying to sleep, it's actually better to get up um, and go and do something else. Go and read, go and listen to an audio book, go and sit on the sofa, have a warm drink, whatever it might be. Um, we want to be creating that good association. Um, so I'm not going to get you to write in the chat because I'm kind of mindful of time and I want to get to questions, but I'd just like you to have a bit of a think about what kind of things we might be able to do that could help us if, we've got, if we're getting up. Um, but like I said, it's very much about you want to keep calm. You don't want to be doing anything that's going to be stimulating and, and wakeful. This technique often feels a little bit um, worrying to families um, to be doing this you know getting up for you know a period of time when you're trying to get to sleep feels counterintuitive but it all comes back again to having the right association between bedding for between going to bed and going to sleep but also not stressing ourselves out the more stressed we get like i said the harder it is so getting up um, and getting out of bed can be quite helpful and then we go back to bed once we're tired and try again Okay, the final technique um, that I'm going to talk about is, uh, it's got a number of different names. I'm going to start by calling it sleep scheduling. Um, and this was nicely mentioned in the chat. And this is where we want to maintain a nice regular sleep wake cycle. Um, so we want our bodies to know and, and to expect what time we're going to go to bed and what time we're going to wake up. And here's where we're going to make it nice and difficult. We also want this to be consistent at the weekend. So as I mentioned earlier, that problem with social jet lag, if we let our bodies do something different at the weekend, it's really hard to move backwards and forwards. Now, again, I very much, this is something we talk about when we're dealing with insomnia. Um, many teenagers would not agree to this. If they don't think they've got sleep problems. Um, but we want to try and keep that consistency with not having an excessive line at the weekend so that our bodies know what to expect. I guess similarly, um, it's also worth just noting that Relatedly, for teenagers in particular who are experiencing this problem with the circadian rhythm, there's also no point going to bed too early. If we're not getting enough sleep, we need to go to bed when we're tired. Otherwise, we're going to lie there awake and experience this problem um, of not being able to get to sleep. The other term that's sometimes used here is called sleep restriction. And this is used very much only when you're working with insomnia and, and it should be guided um, by someone or you know, a, a program that supports it. Um, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on how it works, but I just wanted to highlight the principles. So the idea here is that you use your sleep diaries to work out how much sleep someone is getting in reality. So what's their total sleep time? And then you, go backwards from the time that someone needs to get up. So if they're getting um, seven hours sleep and they need to be up at seven, then you'd say, well, don't go to bed until 12 um, because actually you're getting the same amount of sleep, but it means you get good quality sleep and it's all squeezed together and you're not going to be experiencing the same problems with insomnia. The restriction component then comes in and you take a little bit more time off. So you'd be saying, go to bed at quarter past 12, not 12. 
what happens is that people are so tired um, because of this restriction that's been introduced and the late bedtime um, that they fall asleep quickly and the problem with insomnia goes away very fast um, and as that total sleep time starts increasing you can actually add time back in and you have um, this increase in, in sleep time. So this is actually how you deal with quite serious problems with insomnia. But as I've said, this is not a technique I would be recommending without guided support. Um, so the last thing I want to do for the last couple of minutes, I just want to show you some evidence that this works. <laughs> um, and then hopefully we can move on to a bit of a discussion at the end. So this is a case study that we've published um, when we first developed our program. So Sophia is a, a pseudonym, that's not her real name. Um, but Sophia was a, was a teenager that we worked with. At the time I was working in an anxiety and depression service. So Sophia actually was referred for anxiety um, and she was being treated for anxiety. But unfortunately, it became quite apparent that her insomnia was quite serious. Um, and although she recovered from anxiety, she started experiencing problems with depression as well. So we had, you know, quite an unwell um, young girl who, you know, really needed some support. She also, as part of her depression, was experiencing some quite serious difficulties around self-harm and suicidal thoughts as well. So we offered her the Sleeping Better program, followed by um, an, a treatment for the depression as well. Um, I'm just going to show you some data. So we worked with Sophia over a six week period um, and she had uh, four sessions with us and the parents attended uh, most of those sessions. So it was taking Sophia on average um, well over two hours to get to sleep. So about two hours and 20 minutes on average each night. And she was getting under six hours sleep. So about five hours, 50 minutes again on average each night, which is well under that recommended amount of eight to 10 hours. Um, so we gave her the Sleeping Better program, which did include the sleep restriction. So that last component that I talked about. Um, and if you see, so the, the top line there it, where there's a red border is that time to fall asleep. And, and then that bottom line that also has the red border is the total sleep time. Um, and we see because of that sleep restriction, um, we see that really quick change where she's no longer having that initial problem of insomnia getting to sleep. She's falling asleep really quickly. Um, and what we see, if you remember, I mentioned that once your um, sleep quality be is better, you can start adding time back in. We've got this gradual increase over the six week period where Sophia is starting to get more sleep. So it does take time. She's certainly not well up to the eight hours after six weeks, but she's getting quite a lot more sleep on average each night. And then obviously that adds up to the course of the week as well. Um, we also saw some really nice other wider benefits. So if you remember, I mentioned these things are really good for well-being as well. So she stopped um, self-harming and wasn't experiencing any more suicidal thoughts. She reported not being tired in the day and she'd stopped drifting off at school, which was great. Um, she also actually decided that she didn't feel like she needed treatment for depression. She was happy to kind of go off and continue um, the sleep techniques at home. And we got some nice quotes as well from her and mum about finding it helpful. Um, I'm not going to present any data, but uh, Richard did mention this at the start, actually. We have um, done some initial pilot work in schools with the programme. Um, and at the moment, we are just applying for research funding to evaluate it properly. Um, so we're really hoping this is something that we can offer in the future. Um, so unfortunately, it's not something that we can offer now. But in the meantime, what I have done is highlighted some really great resources. So if you do want to know more about how we sleep or how we work with sleep. Um, I've got these books here up on the slide. I'll keep this up for a moment, um, but I think you'll have access to this uh, afterwards. So you can obviously come back and, and have a look at the resources, but I basically broken down. They're all written by absolutely fantastic experts um, and they cover quite a nice range of understanding the science of sleep. Um, all the way up to supporting children with sleep. The book there actually isn't, um, any kind of books written that are self-help guides, particularly for adolescents that I would particularly recommend. The book I've given is, is for um, helping children with sleep. So the techniques are a little bit different, um, but most of the um, suggestions overlap a lot and it is still a really brilliant book. So um, I think regardless of the age of the child, you know, it, it gives you some really nice guidance. Um, 
so uh, yeah would highly recommend any of these if you're if you're interested i think um i wanted to suggest that you just take a, a little break to have a think about um kind of things that you might go away and, and implement so maybe i'll just i know it's uh 835 maybe if you just take a moment and have a think about anything that you'd like to try um and post any ideas you've got in the chat if you're happy to share them um, and whilst you're doing that i guess uh richard uh, abby we can perhaps start to have a look at some questions that we can answer for um the the guests Absolutely. i think that's everything so, yeah, thank I, you. i've made a um a note of any questions that have been asked up to this point um, so don't feel like you need to repeat your question if you've asked it further up. We'll we'll have a chat through those in a moment. Great. So yeah, just um, take a moment, have a process what's just been talked about. And like I said, feel free to um, comment on your ideas in the in the chat. Um, shall I stop sharing my slides now, Abby? Um, completely up to you. I, I don't know whether you perhaps want to leave it on the resources page in I case can do, yeah. Were, yeah, that that might not be a bad idea. Great idea. Uh, hang on. There we are. Okay, should we start with a couple of the questions that um, came earlier on in the evening and then we can perhaps have a look at any that come in now? Of course. So there was there was a couple of questions earlier, which I think we're asking about the same thing. Um, and actually, it's okay. one that I'm really interested in myself. Um, asking about sleep apps. Um, and I think particularly mm. whether listening to sleep hypnosis is a good idea or if there's any problems with that. Yeah, so um, so sleep apps is very much the same as the Fitbit. So you're reliant on your phone being able to detect what you're doing, which is never going to be as reliable as a, a kind of a tool that is designed specifically for measuring sleep. Um, having said that, uh, assuming that people are talking about kind of the monitoring, I'll come back to the um, kind of the hypnosis stuff in a second. Um, so I think the same as with the Fitbit, really, I would suggest there's no harm in monitoring sleep through your phone, um, but read it with a note of caution. Um, I think, you know, if it says something and you think, hang on, I don't think that's what happened. You're probably more likely to be right than your phone is. Um, people are actually pretty good at self-reporting sleep, even though we might think we forget. Um, so I guess that's kind of the monitoring side in terms of um, kind of apps that help us fall asleep, things like um, Calm, uh, Headspace, there's quite a lot of apps out there. Again, I, I think it's kind of personal preference. So I think this really comes back to that being relaxed. So if the apps help you to relax, then that's fine. Um, I think you have to draw on whatever resources work best for you. Um, so there will be some people that don't find them useful, um, but I think if people do, absolutely go ahead and use them. Great, thank you. Um, there was one that I, I don't know whether it was about a, a younger child or a teenager um, asking about what if a child kind of wants a low light on whilst they're sleeping? Is, is that going to be harmful? Is that OK? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, and again, I, I'm worried I'm going to end up saying the same thing for every question that you um, that you ask, Abby. Um, it's going to be dependent on the child. So I think you're right, particularly with younger children, this is quite common, although some teenagers will want it as well. Um, I guess the dimmer the light, the better. So I think uh, I remember when I was young, having a little tiny plug in night light that went into the wall that was really quite dark. Um, but it was enough that, you know, your eyes adjust and it's still quite helpful. Something like that um, is less likely to be disruptive. Um, but it is, yeah, very much going to come down to the child. I think, you know, if it's actually helping to soothe them and meaning that they're not stressed and worried that's probably more helpful um mm. so as long as it's not really bright um i think again it's, it's kind of a point of negotiation great thank you um, and then, and one more that was asked further at the chat um somebody was asking about whether a lack of melatonin can be a factor which affects teenagers and sleep yeah so melatonin is obviously an important part i, I didn't talk about this lots in the presentation um so we know that melatonin so this is the hormone that helps us to fall asleep um and some other countries do um prescribe melatonin for sleep it's um uh, not done in the uk unless it's kind of for other problems it, it's a bit harder to get hold of in the uk um and the reason for that is that the evidence actually is still quite mixed um so the idea is is that you you need the melatonin release to happen um so that you can then fall asleep so what happens with young people um and this is linked to the circadian rhythm that i mentioned at the start sorry teenagers in particular is that the um melatonin doesn't get released until later 
So they still get it, um, but they don't get it at the point at which we might like them to fall asleep. Um, so there are various people who work more biologically that are investigating ways to um, kind of encourage melatonin release. So rather than giving out melatonin, looking at things like bright light therapy um, or supplements that might help to increase melatonin to see whether or not there's a way to encourage that to happen earlier in the evening. Um, again, it's still very much a, a new um, growing field. So we don't have um, enough evidence really yet, but it's something that's being explored. Watch this space. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um... Somebody, I think, is just sort of confirming what they think you said. Is it a fallacy then that you um, get better quality sleep before midnight? Um, yes, <laughs> um, I suppose so. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I suppose it will come back to the kind of the lark owl thing that um, if you're the kind of person who needs to get to bed early and your body can't function if you don't, then then you know actually that early bit, I suppose, and I guess this is maybe what the question kind of comes down to is that that early bit is really important so um you know i talked about the sleep stages having deep sleep at the beginning um is really important because you need that kind of physically to be able to function and to be you know re repairing yourself um but if your body clock wants to go to bed later that's fine as long as it works but the complications come in where having a late body clock doesn't work for your kind of day-to-day -day yeah. life where we make them get up for school <laughs> yeah sorry about that <laughs> um okay Th there's a couple of questions here which i think are asking a similar thing around um whether oversleeping you know in teenagers matters if it's not seeming to cause problems so you know does it matter that you know teenagers are sleeping into midday and the weekends or holidays if actually the rest of the time they're perfectly fine getting up for school and, and don't seem to be having any issues yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I think, um, like I said, it, sleep is such an individual thing. We're so different. Some people can sleep loads um, and they're quite content and they get up fine when they need to. Some people need very little sleep at all and they can still function on that. Um, so I think when sleep becomes a problem is when it starts causing issues with daily functioning so if you're getting up okay you're able to kind of become alert you know relatively early once you're up and about if you can concentrate and you can you know study your work or whatever it is that you do and at that night you go to bed fine and you fall asleep quite quickly doesn't really matter how you're kind of sleeping it really is the daytime bit that you want to be looking out for it's when you see those daytime problems that you might think mm, you know something might not be going quite right with the sleep and i guess sort of linked to that um can sleeping on the weekend to catch up on lost sleep during the week cause long-term problems it's a really good question um and it's something that we've been trying to do a bit more research on actually understanding a bit more about the the weekend sleep um so I think I, I kind of similar to the last question, really, for some young people, they will do their catch up on the weekend and they'll be fine. And that's OK, that even though they have that week day sleep deficit, um, they'll just catch up and then on Monday they'll get up and it won't be a problem. Um, whereas for some young people, the evidence seems to be that it's more that we don't either we don't get enough that the catch up isn't enough or that it knocks our body clock off and then we're disrupted. Um, but I, yeah, I think it, the catch-up sleep is okay as long as it it works, you know, as long as that helps. Great. Um, I'm, I'm aware that we're kind of, you know, <laughs> running uh, towards quarters of nine now. So I'm just going to ask you the last kind of two or three ones that are already on the chat here. Okay. Um, somebody's asking about a red light light um, being recommended for sleep. And is that something that, you know, you might recommend people trying to use? Yeah, I mean... <sighs> So I actually saw that question pop up and I was mulling that one over. So the light literature is a really interesting one. And I think, I guess what people are probably most aware of is the blue light problem. So devices that use lots of um, blue light are not good because they suppress melatonin release. Um, so we kind of have this kind of common idea that we don't want to be on our devices because of blue light. Um, and that is true. We know that blue light interferes with um, sleep with melatonin but actually the evidence seems to be more that it's about what the activity is that you're doing on the device rather than the light itself so if you're using something with blue light but it's quite calm and relaxing it doesn't have that much of an impact whereas if you're gaming and you're 
shooting zombies or whatever it might be and there's lots of blue light coming out it's very stimulating and actually the stimulation is more of a problem but um the kind of the point about the red light um uh, very much you know it's the blue lights or the very white lights the ones that are the problem so anything that is much more kind of dull so yeah you often see screens kind of a bit more of an orangey reddish um will help i'm not sure about any literature that suggests that it actually encourages sleep um but that's not to say that it, it might not exist it might be out there um but definitely you know where we are using lights those color lights are going to be better yeah there's, there's an option on lots of kind of devices now aren't there to kind of set your warm yeah. light settings on different times yeah exactly um and then there's several questions all linked around i think uh things around kind of sleepwalking and nightmares um so whether lack of sleep can result in bad dreams or, or nightmares and whether you have any research on repetitive nightmares and how to overcome them. Um, I'm going to cop out a little bit because um, it's very far from my area of expertise. It's, it's a, quite an unrelated problem. Um, so we work quite differently with uh, night terrors, nightmares. Um, I mean, I guess there's going to be some underlying factors. So generally things like stress, have massive impacts on lots of areas of sleep so um, there will be some bits that overlap a little bit um, but i'm going to be careful and not say too much because i wouldn't want to say the wrong thing um, sure. but we would work with them quite differently clinically um, you know you wouldn't be doing these types of, of techniques i think um, alison harvey's book might touch on it possibly um, but it's definitely in um, the alice gregory nodding off book i know she talks about um, nightmares in fact i probably expect it's in the other one as well so there might be some um, other guidance out there that people can draw on sorry to not have a better comprehensive answer for you no no that signposting is really useful thank you um i've got an interesting one here is there any seasonality to this advice so you know anything about dealing with early summer mornings i suppose where the light you know is waking you up and, and that links actually to an, another one i saw about the most i think the word used was appropriate way to wake someone up whether it's you know opening the curtains speaking to them a bright light yeah i mean it's, it's a brilliant question and you're absolutely right the, the questions there what they're tapping into so seasonality hugely affects us um so yeah absolutely you get it both ways in the winter it's really hard because we don't have enough natural light to help us wake up and the natural light is what stimulates the hormones um and equally on the other side like you said in the summer when it's really bright if we don't have you know blackout blinds and we're quite sensitive to waking up we're likely to wake up really early so um in the sum in the kind of summer months we probably want to be doing what we can to make sure we don't get that light until we want it and need it um whereas in the winter we're doing everything we can to get as much light in um in terms of waking someone up natural light's the best one because then the body will do it completely naturally so open the curtains if there is any light outside um open the curtains because that's going to stimulate all the right hormones in the body it kind of the body's processing the the light around us um but that probably isn't enough for lots of young people. So they might need a bit of a gentle or not so gentle encouragement perhaps as well. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I, I think that probably covers off most of the questions. And I, I don't want to kind of keep everybody on here past their own bedtimes. Um, so can I just end really Faith by saying that I found it incredibly fascinating. Um, the kind of the psychoeducation side of it is particularly interesting and all the research is really good to hear about that but also so great to have some tangible takeaways to kind of go away and try i'm sure a lot of people listening will have very much appreciated those kind of practical tips and techniques and, and the signposting to further resources as well um, i will be sending out uh the slides that faith has kindly provided us with um and uh i'll make the recording of the talk available as well so if anybody kind of wants to recap anything that they have heard tonight um, or seen tonight they'll be able to do that um, so yeah, thank you very much to everybody for coming along and listening and, and thank you once again to Faith. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's been a pleasure and I, and I hope it's been useful for, um, for some of you out there as well. Absolutely. Thank you.